Hello, and welcome to the King Heroes Journey podcast. My name is Beth Martins, and I am here today with Steve Falconer. Super, super happy to have you. Hello, Steve. Hi, Beth. Great to be here. And uh, yeah, it's it's fun. I've been looking forward since Acapulco, so going to be cool. Likewise. Yeah. Welcome, folks. So we're going to have a very interesting conversation today on some things that, you know, it's... Um, it's hard to find. You're you're a good researcher, Steve, and and uh, I'll take a minute to introduce you as well. But um, you don't mind stepping off and coloring outside the lines in places where you can't prove a lot of anything and can be called conjecture, but it also can be called research that you do inside yourself. That's what I'm personally a very big fan of. Uh, so Steve, if you don't know him, is a former Chicago native living in Copenhagen, Denmark. Please say hi to Jack for me, by the way. Oh, yeah, we'll do. I think Jack's watching, actually, or he's going to be soon, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Good, good. He's he really here. nice to meet him as well. Uh, and uh, Steve is a father and researcher into all things hidden, esoteric, and out-of-the-ordinary daily experience with a gift for debunking or demystifying occulted information. I was uh, junking out on your series on Atlantis last night. I didn't make, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't make it all the way to the end, but it was really good because I have always just not looked into that and you, I sort of know about it in the background. And it was really fun just to see all of the overlays that you did with the maps and hello, John Wills, nice to see you. The, um, yeah, it's, it, it, is, it is fun to go and... Uh, it go off the map and consider these much more deep, what can be only inner experiences, but because we can talk to each other and we can corroborate and see uh, from each other's eyes, talk about things that are very abstract, then uh, somehow it's always very satisfying. So we're going to talk about life and death and life after death. And well, I've it can't really get more abstract than that because again, I'll, and I'll put a disclaimer, I've never had a near-death experience. Have you? I actually have, yes. Great, then I can't wait to hear it. And <laughs> I don't astral travel. I have woken up in the middle of dreams by trying to look at my hands. And then when you realize you don't have them, you figure out you're in a dream. Um, but I've never had a near-death experience. So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today, I have to put my Space Busters disclaimer. Um, it's a lot. We are going to be talking abstract and conjecture for me. I'm going to be talking about I've researched a lot of different sides of this, and I have friends who have had them and been to seances with very real experiences. So I, I don't put my belief in one thing or another. I just say I look at several perspectives of what might happen or what's going on here or all that. And what I say is not the truth and it's not, not the truth. It's just my perspective and that's it. So let's dive in and start talking about life and death. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you, Steve, this is actually a really big part of the work that I do. I know you and I get to know each other better. Maybe I'll be on your channel at some point as well. And uh, because I almost died 25 years ago after I was told that I wouldn't survive after a second diagnosis of a serious cancer, I shouldn't say that word over here, but we'll uh, use a C word, I guess. And uh, then it forced me to look at something that otherwise I may not have because in this culture we're indoctrinated that, you know, death is evil, that you don't talk about it. Um, if you've been through the death of, family members or friends, you might notice how incredibly awkward that is, that nobody knows how to be. And there certainly are cultures that do. So it, yeah, it's one of those subjects that people tend to run for the hills. And then th this was the point I wanted to make, that there's not a single day that goes by that someone doesn't tell me, and this could be you too, that, <laughs> um, that they are not afraid to die. And so this is a really big subject I'm actually just about to send out to the Anarchapoco people that took my King's Calling workshop, uh, an audio on how to deprogram that, that uh, what I call the death program. It's very big, it's very prevalent, and it's it makes no exceptions. And it is how we're controllable. So I love this subject. I'm, did, did you cross, so did you have like the near-death experience? Did you die and and come back or did that happen to you or it wasn't the typical i saw the light 
kind of thing that you'll hear mm -hmm. over and over and over again with and, and I haven't done a deep dive into people's near death experiences strangely I just it, you know I have my own uh, I just got to that point where there was no more fight and no more life right and uh, I had called in a lot of emergencies up until that point at this point I decided okay I'm not calling it in my body is not even able to sit up there's nothing I can do to make myself happy there's no uh, life left to live here I stopped fighting, you know, that's like that classic thing that they, um, you know, go team, real uh, warrior-like, you know, survive this at all costs. And I had been like that. And, and finally, all of that was gone. And I just surrendered to death. I let it have me. And so I slipped through this kind of liminal place, but very quickly landed in myself in a space that was entirely full of life and not full of death at all, exactly the opposite of what I expected. I was filled with life to such a, a great degree that I went into remission from the um, cancer that I was, the first round of, of cancer that I had been diagnosed with. And uh, I downloaded all kinds of insights and, and awareness. I'll go into more detail about that, but uh, but came back and lived to tell. I was still re-diagnosed re 18 months later. So it wasn't like that was behind me, but it was the first time that I just came face to face with death and didn't run from it. I, I mean, the, the thing is, I, I like to look at a lot of Eastern um, philosophy and also Western, um, you know, hermeticism or ma magicians versus Gnostics. And there's, there's a difference, but what's really going on is uh, you're either here in the present as the Eastern mystics will tell you, there's only now there's no, and there isn't even that cause that's moving all the time. So it's all an illusion, but most people's mind and consciousness is either worried about what's going to happen tomorrow or what has happened to them in the past and their victim. There's only now. So really, you may as well be dead. If you're not here right now, then you are dead already. And anyway, as soon as you're born, as Bob Dylan saying, he who is not busy being born is busy dying. You know, from the time you're born, you're dying. But really, even what we're going to talk about, it doesn't really matter what happens after you die, which we're going to get into spec speculatively for me, because I've never had a near-death experience you're going to be there either way, whether you're there or not, or whatever happens, or you see the light or get a life review, or you shut your eyes and wake up as a newborn baby or whatever happens, you have no choice. Just like you don't have a choice what's going to happen to you one second from now, it's going to happen. So to worry about death is as stupid as wasting your life worrying about yesterday or tomorrow. It's the same thing. You're only alive if you're here right now appreciating what this realm is. That's it. Otherwise, you are dead. So what do you care about dying? It's going to be the same as you are now <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't know how to be here now. And like you said, when you finally surrendered to all the worry, you were present, right? You're like I think that movie Kung Fu Panda, they said that's why they call it the present because it's a gift. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting you talk about choice. And I, I, I do believe life and death are the two things we don't choose. Now, maybe the, the kind of life or, but you know, the timing of it, for example, nobody knows when a baby's going to be born. I remember. Uh, one of my clients was losing their mother recently and, and she was saying something, oh yeah, my mom's just eating right now. And I'm like, she's not going to die. And then she died the next morning. And it was like, well, I don't know. Why do I even, <laughs> why do I even say that? Right. And that's uh, quite, that's quite yeah. that happened to a lot of people. I know um, like my best, my best mate, the other space buster, uh, their dad was dying. They all got called in from around the country to go see him. And, and the night before, he, he sat up from like a coma and he was fine and talking to them all. So they didn't say goodbye. They all went off to the, you know, the cafeteria and just, oh, we'll go home. He seems fine. And then he, he passed over that night. And it was like, you hear this a lot. They don't want to say goodbye to you because it's an attachment to this realm. So they all of a sudden have this thing and then they're like, okay, I'm fine. And everyone leaves and then they die when they're like, fine. They don't want to do it in front of you. It's quite, it's a really repeated story quite often. 
I have it with both my parents. They, I feel like they went out of their way to make sure I wasn't in the room when they died. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because both. I think it's hard if you're going to leave a realm that you're attached to physically and mentally and spiritually, then yeah, you don't want it. It's hard to leave, you know, if you're attached to it. So you want to get rid of all the things you're attached to as much as you can. It's, it, I, I look at a lot of near death experiences and they, this is like, so common this theme just repeats over and over again yeah and people really suffer that when they have the illusion that they have control over life or death birth or death then they suffer it that uh, and again a colleague had lost somebody in their life and and they were beating themselves up i should have done this and i should have done that and uh, and really suffering because the loss itself is 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 suffering. But then when you got that add on, like I could have this and I could have that, as if you're in control. And that's and that's the big thing, right? Like we've been through this medical tyranny where they're like, "I'm keeping you alive. I'm keeping you safe." And <laughs> yeah. it's like, no, you're not actually. In reality, let's, let's stop reality. Yeah, exactly. You know, and 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 you know what is alive really and. You're, you know, the only one keeping you alive is you and your spirit and your mind or what you call your ego or your uh, personality, whatever you want to call that. You're alive for you. No one's keeping you alive or not. And they, they can put you on respirators and pump you full of whatever. If you want to go, you're going to go like they, you know, they, just like when they say, well, you've got two months to live. And then all of a sudden, nine years later, you're like, well, I'm still alive. <laughs> so who's keeping who alive? Yeah. You tried to kill me nine years ago. and I'm still going bastard. So who's, who's, who's in charge here? It's not them, you know, mm -hmm. but it is, it's very important that you understand placebo and nocebo. Like do not listen to these doctors when they tell you this stuff, like don't listen to them, you know, they're because you, you can, you can get false beliefs that will take your spirit out of this physical realm if you believe them. And it's very powerful. You almost can't not believe them because the moment you step in there, you make that appointment, you are actually handing over some of your power. And you, you, it doesn't mean that it's a, uh, you know, insurmountable, but I noticed that, that every time I would call my doctor for a problem, then I would lose my power and I would end up more or less doing what they said, or I would do it under great duress. And then they would fight me and there would be the, all that tension of that and lost energy that could have gone into healing. So I just finally fired my, my doctors and I said, okay, I'm, I'm just going to take this in my hands. I have God as my witness for that. And I've, I've noticed how when I work, God works with me and what's you know what let's back up i'd like to uh, <laughs> yeah. i just like to see like how did you come to all of this work how long have you been doing maybe it's the space busters or the work in the esoteric how did you get inspired to do all of that um i you know i i mean i just i don't know i i used to be um quite an agitated angry virgo <laughs> i used to be a regular normie and um 2005, six, seven, I just had one of these awakenings and I started going down all the rabbit holes and all that. And um, I started running into some people who were in the Merovingian. They, I, I ran into some occult people very early on and they were speaking in numerology and code and um, syncretism. And, you know, and, and I was, and as a Virgo, I like things explained very clearly. That's why my channel's popular. I take occulted information and explain it to a dummy. It's not that difficult. But back then I was saying, just tell me, just tell me what the hell you're talking about without all this code. And they're like, we can't. We can't tell you because you have a golf ball sized consciousness and you need an ocean sized consciousness to understand this. So until you get how everything relates to each other, we can tell you all we want. You won't understand it. And I, you know, as a Virgo, I was like, I'm going to dedicate my life to understand to prove you wrong. I'm going to learn what you're talking about and show other people that it's you who can't explain it, not me who can't understand it. Um, so I kind of got into it that way. You know, that's really what got me into it. But as you get into it, yeah, I just started getting fascinated by uh, near death experiences and 
the mental, astral, uh, lower astral, etheric, physical, like the idea of different planes and, and the, the idea of spirit or soul or consciousness condensing into physical matter, like as we all do, why are we here? What is here? What's the point? You know, and and you and and luckily I ran into esoteric information, which I'm not saying is right or wrong, because even in those fields, <laughs> every other person you talk to is different. No near death experiences. Every person you talk to has a kind of but different experience, like something you know. And sometimes you don't want to believe them because they have religious affiliations. <laughs> you know, you just you don't know who to trust, who not to, who's full of BS. Um, so, but for me, it's like, again, I do it more out of, out of curiosity because you're going to get there anyway, no matter what, if you die and there is a sensation of you and in, in a, a life review and your soul move, you know, like it's going to happen either way. So to me, it's not paramount. Uh, again, it's just more worrying about what isn't right now. It's just worrying about the future and, and you're missing out on now. But it is fascinating, though. I love talking about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is. And then speaking of, you know, the, the different way that people die, some in a lot more peace than others and with a lot less regret than others. And I think if you've never in your life asked a question about what you're going to regret on your deathbed, you're somewhat damning yourself to wait until that very compromised time to find some answers and and resolve and and heal those regrets and that's in some ways why i feel like my early brush with death was such a gift because mm -hmm. then i could live almost every other day of my life asking what am i going to regret on my deathbed and i know exactly what i'm going to regret it's what i regret right now yeah well it seems a lot of people who have near death experiences they either get what they call a life review or they get shown um, what their actions, good and bad, have done through the, the lens of the other people they've been interacting with. And it seems like, I don't know for sure, but a lot of the ones who say it, it seems like they were being selfish. And it's okay to be selfish. I don't mean there's anything wrong with serving the self. But it seems like uh, they were ignorant of how their actions were harming others. When, when their self-action was stepping on others to get what they want. Um, it seems like when they get given a second chance or whatever to come back, it was to show them you're not supposed to die yet because you were maybe supposed to be here to figure this out. And for some reason, you didn't get it, dum-dum. So we're giving you the chance to go back or you can get maybe born again and do it, you know, do this all over again. Um, it, it seems like that is a common when theme. When you pass over and you go to the other side, one of the first things that happens is they show you your life. And they show you every single thing you did, every single thing you thought, every single thing that happened to you. And this is like a board over there, I guess you would say, like a conference board, a council, council is more a better word, and it has your guides, your guardians, your uh, the elders, the masters, and they're all sitting there advising. They can't interfere, they can't make you do anything, but they advise, and the first thing they do is show you your entire life of everything you just went through, <clears throat> and you're looking at it, and believe me, it's not pleasant. Because it's not all the good things, it's all the things that ever happened to you, everything you ever said, everything you ever did. And you're looking at it and you say, oh my gosh, why did I do that? Why did I say that? But then to make it even harder, they not only show it from your viewpoint, they show you the way it was through all the people you ever had contact with. You see it through their eyes. So it does seem like you're supposed to figure this out while you're here. But, you know, as you know, our society is set up by people um, who give us religions and uh, other ideologies that don't let you even fall into this. It's amazing this information is even out there at all because you never run across it. Does that make sense? 
It does, yes. And this morning I got an email about this stream that I'd sent out yesterday, and uh, and it was somebody warning me, like, oh, you're in satanic territory over there talking about reincarnation, and all you need is Jesus. And I was I was starting to go down that path myself. The pandemic sent me back to the Bible, and um, I spent a few years trying to make sense of it, and it just doesn't. So that it doesn't mean I don't love Jesus. I do love Jesus, but I don't have any sense that we're talking about something satanic here because, uh, oh, here comes sirens to <laughs> add some color to this. Uh, because to me, it's all about motive, right? Yeah. What you're talking about, what you're studying, what you're practicing. It's like, why are you practicing? And yeah. that was the big gift for me while I was dying to to see that, oh yeah, I'm doing all of these fantastic things for myself, but I'm doing it because I'm afraid to die, not because I love life. That That is exactly it. It's the, it's the fear of death that's controlling everyone. Why don't you revolt against the, the, the powers that shouldn't be? Well, you're afraid they're going to kill you or lock you up. You're, you're afraid of death or you're, you're afraid to live because you're afraid of death. Once that shackle's gone and no matter which, you know, principle you subscribe to, there are beliefs that uh, you you are immortal, your your soul or your spirit is being perfected and you can either go up to the mind of God or you can shut your eyes and open it up and you'll be in the next incarnation and won't know where you were before, just like all of us. We just woke up as babies and have no clue what happened. Some people say, well, I had a past life regression. And I say, well, I might have been Joan of Arc too. There's no saying you're the only Joan of Arc. We might all be Joan of Arc. When you get into higher realms of consciousness, there is no past, present, and future. All possibilities are coming from the one oversoul mind of God. Therefore, you're all that. So, you know, it, but again, what it's really about is liberating yourself from the fear of what comes next, because no matter what you do, what comes next is coming next, whether you like it or not. <laughs> so to be afraid of what you're naturally a part of is ridiculous. It's it's uh, insanity. Exactly. And it ends up being literally crippling people. I was just hearing Ian Smith, shout out to him on Alpha Vedic, which you were on as well. Great, fantastic interview. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we got into a different, I have different beliefs about Jesus and things like that. And I'm not here to religiously kick off with anyone. So but yeah. Yeah, no worries at all. I, there's all right. <laughs> nothing off the table here, but um, I was just thinking, you're talking about liberating yourself from the fear of what's coming next. That that, that fear of the unknown is registered as death. You're, yeah. walk, you're walking off the plank. This is the unconscious. Nobody would say that consciously, but that's what's happening. You literally don't see. You can't anticipate. You can't predict. You don't know if it's going to go okay or not, but... If you get used to doing that thing anyway, going into the unknown, risking growth, risking learning, risking failing yeah. in, in, in that unknown, then it makes you stronger over time. So, and, and, and yeah. just, um, what I brought up Ian is because he was talking about how as a business owner, uh, he was the only one speaking out. And, and then all of a sudden he was noticing like, oh, there are people speaking out, but they're all women. And what's up with that? Where are all the men? And, <laughs> yeah, right? And it, that's not a criticism. It's just, it just, it was, I also noted that, that the majority of our, of our groups, it was all women and mamas, you know, mamas mm -hmm. have, they're like, oh, you're coming for my kids. Then you're going to see the bear over here. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, just, you know, being, being that person that, that risks speaking out and speaking your truth and going into the unknown and, uh, uh, doing that over and over again, you become quite a role model for others. Well, we are actually coming into Aquarius right now, which is a feminine age. So that's, you know, here's what the elites do. I, this is off topic, but they, they know how these energies work. So they know we just came out of a very um, masculine rule, law dominated, male, male is law and rule and all this. They know that. They know we're coming into this. So that's why they're pushing transgender and a feminism and trying to emasculate the men because they knew this cycle was coming anyway. This is already the natural energy coming. So that's when you're saying, well, where are all the men? We just had 2000 years to do our thing. <laughs> now it's time where the women are stepping up and the Rockefeller's like, yeah, we gave the women the, we gave them the right to vote so we could tax them and work. And, you know, they're like, we created feminism. And you're like, no, you didn't. 
the creation made you create feminism. You think you did it for this, but you did it because it was coming anyway. So the women are sick of our shit. They are going to step up and they are stepping up. And the men are becoming more emasculated. And people are like, where are the men? And you're like, well, we're still here, but it's just that we're more, we're not like the hard asses we used to be because that age is going. Interesting. Interesting. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like that's where we went. We had 2,000 years and we fucked it up. So, <laughs> right, right. Fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> Because I consider myself a recovering feminist. I literally, yeah. I literally no longer feel like men are responsible for all the ills in the world. And I really did believe that. That was, you know, I thought, and I thought I invented that movement. Yeah. It, uh, so I, I, I saw how much I was psyoped and how much it really, you know, ripped me off in my life because uh, we're all masculine, feminine. And, and the, it, that was the thing when my dad died, I noticed how the war really was in me, not out there with me and men. And uh, so, yeah. uh, but that's interesting that it, it was coming anyway. And do you think, do you think the controllers just saw that coming and then, and then did everything possible to make it skewed? And this is what they do. They, they just push you over the cliff. They, they know where it's going. That this is why they're all astrologers. People are like, how come they're satanic? You're like, they're not satanic. They study astrology. And the reason they do it and do all the rituals on these dates and energies is because they know what the energies are. So they say, how can we take advantage of that? So they push it to their advantage. It's coming anyway, just not as extreme. You know, they're making it more extreme than it would be. It would be more subtle, but they're like, well, this is coming anyway. Uh, what do they say? Never let a good crisis go to waste. Or, you know, like they have that kind of mentality. So yeah. They they push it. They they think, oh, we invented the feminist movement. You're like, no, you didn't. It, nature has been doing, like, get out of here, you know. And then we can get into that. Like, there are the ideas that the spirit and, and the soul, as we can talk about, what is the soul? Because everyone you ask has a different belief in what that is. It's sexless. It doesn't. It's not male or female. So, if you believe in you have a soul and you believe in reincarnation, or even don't but believe you have a soul. It's sexless. So for you as a woman right now to be against m men is ridiculous because your soul's sexless. So you're half against yourself. And as you said, maybe you figured out that's the conflict you're having is you hate half yourself. Exactly. <laughs> that was exactly it. Oh, wow. Joke's on me. <laughs> Joke's on you because yeah. half of you is man too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's interesting also that you bring up the sexless part. I was just listening to uh, Matt Presty interview. And unfortunately, I don't remember his name. It may, might have been Dan something. And he wrote a rather large book on Genesis. And uh, have, have you seen this, how he deconstructed? He went back to the Hebrew, not the translation of the translation of the translation, but he actually wanted to know, you know exactly what it was saying. And that part in the Bible where God talks like, he's a plural that there's a whole bunch of us over here and knowing the word Elohim is a plural word. Yeah. And um, so he interprets the, the, um, that plurality to actually be the, the children of God, the angels that are sexless and that, um, that in fact they made us in their image. So it kind of is corroborating with what you're saying right now. Well, yeah, I, I look at it more like the, the, the Elohim are the seven planets in astrology that vest us all of our, uh, uh, basically our seven, our virtues and sins to get over. And they are plural too as well. And the church took the word angles, which are the light angles from these seven heavenly bodies, the sun, moon, and five, and changed it to angels as if they're beings instead of these uh, electromagnetic portals or energy portals. So there are several several different ways to look at this. And again, you, you always look at it through your filter. There's the religious filter. Oh, the, don't astrology, the Bible. And you're like, it says, can you unchain the hands of Maseroth, which is the Zodiac? Like the whole Bible is ancient Irish astrology from start to finish. But the church is like, don't look at that because, you know, they, they have their agendas and things. And it's okay if you don't. Like you say, we're all on the hero's journey. So if you if you want to take the bible literally you can and if you don't you're on a different path that you know 
it's it's not saying one's right or wrong. It's saying there are multiple ways to look at it. And yeah, I, to me, the Elohim are the planets and mm -hmm. astrology is the science that backs that up for me. But, you know, and, and I am Roman Catholic raised, but I'm not uh, a Bible believer anymore. <laughs> I am. I, I just I just read the Bible differently than maybe I used to. Yeah, I haven't done the deep dive into the astrology uh, in the Bible, but the little bit that I've seen, there seems to be uh, immense consistency that w that when you read the Bible that way, it does end up making a lot more sense. And there's, you know, when you're when you're talking about the cosmology and the description of rather than this, especially the the Old Testament God that is uh, more of that. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and, I think like in the in, in Genesis, God makes the sun on the fourth day. Well, a day is supposed to be the earth rotating around the sun. That's how you know day and night. So if there's no sun, how can there be three days? <laughs> if there is no sun till the fourth day, Good clearly point. you're looking at a metaphor here. I mean, come on. It doesn't even make sense right from the third paragraph. You're like, come on, man. You know, so, but, you know, people like to pick and choose. They like to nitpick. You know, all the water's above, and you're like, are you sure it's even talking about the earth? It could be talking about an embryo from start to finish, uh, the formation of a cell or a double split or an embryo or anything. Are you sure this is even talking about the earth and not the earth that the, the esoteric people call the body and the spirit and mind? <laughs> There's so many ways to look at it. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's where we all get into fights. Like, you don't understand what you're reading. And like, well, the book's so genius you can understand it any way you like. Like I said earlier, if you read the Bible with a golf ball size consciousness, you're going to take away a golf ball size understanding of it. And if you come back to it later with an ocean size consciousness of study into all the scientific fields and syncretism, you're going to go, oh, that makes sense finally. Because most of it don't make sense if you take it literally. Yes, exactly. And then back to angles and angels. And um, yeah. I had a small revelation, but it was a big revelation. I'll never forget. Yeah. I was trying to see the sun off my balcony here. And I've got a roof where at certain times of the year, you lose that sun and it's just it's just gone. It's like it's gone. It's, and it, But my mind's going, no, I know it's out there. <laughs> It's just, just, it's just not on me and it's not pleasing me at this time. So, so then I, I just, my body started going out the door and I went and I found the sun next door and I put myself in there and I, and I realized like, this is, this is to me angelic that I, that I simply shifted my angle and the sun could see me. And then I had a much more pleasing experience, which we might associate with angels. I know there's dark ones too, but you know, just that simple thing of perspective. And like you're saying, if you want to go and read the, the Bible in that literal way, and that's your free will, then that's the perspective that you're going to hold. That's the angels that you're going to call in. If you want to talk about it that way, yeah. if you want to broaden out and expand, then you can have that too. The body to you on the other side. And the second you're on the other side, everything makes sense. I was in this beautiful, it was a field surrounded by gardens. Uh, there was a gazebo and a bench beside it. And there was like a creek running sort of under the grass from like a pond to this little creek. My guides were there and they were just there in support. They didn't tell me what to do. They didn't help me make the choice. So my NDE was specifically to make a choice whether I was going to die and stay there or not. I get to make this choice. Time doesn't exist on the other side. So in actual fact, like it was maybe 25 minutes that my soul was out of my body. It wasn't that long, but it felt like I was there for 50 years, 100 years, 10 minutes. Like there, there just was no time, no pressure. There was nobody saying, you need to make this choice because, you know, if you're going to die, the seizure is going to kill you. So you have this much time till you have the seizure. And my guides did gently guide me and they showed me, you know, if you stay here, your family's going to be okay. So they were standing on the other side because our higher selves are always there. There are definitely, um, you know, some call it the jinn or, you know, demons or angels, whatever you want to call it. There are entities outside of our perceivable electromagnetic spectrum that you could call angels and demons and guardian. Uh, there are, I'm convinced there are things outside of what we see, feel and, and experience 
that are there, <laughs> you know. Um, but to call them angels is not, they're twisting, the word angels is angles from, from the planets. It's, it's talking about energy beams. Now, there are, it seems there are guardians who are with us that we don't know. And we've all felt it and experienced it, whether you call it a whisper in your head or... Spiritual planetarium in which the seven stars of the ancients shine in the structure of the human soul. The soul, therefore, has its controls, its divisions, its subdivisions. And in some instances, the ancients believed that there were several guardian angels assigned to each person for various reasons. For example, supposing this person was decide, had decided to become a priest, the guardian angel would be, therefore, able to select a priestly guardian for that life. Another one wished to be an artist, and in addition to the natal daemon, as it was called, there was a special angel appointed to perfect beauty in the life of that person. All beautiful and good things come from beings and not from circumstances or incidents. That which is, as one ancient said, that which is great enough and strong enough to bring a man to his knees in the presence of a great painting is not dead. It is alive. Beauty is a living thing. Beauty is a part of the soul. All parts of the good in man are soul powers. And those that go against these soul powers uh, lose or are deficient and gradually d drop back again to a comparatively animal level of existence. The soul, therefore, is the substance of the good, the beautiful, and the uh, aspiring. As, as we have said on some occasions before, when Stradivarius was asked how he happened to make violins, he replied, God made Antonio to make violins. And in this concept of the uh, guardian soul, when the soul comes into life, it is supposed to have the power to select within a certain range what it will do with life after it gets here. It chooses its own career and faces the problems before they occur. And if he decides, like Stradivarius, to make violins, a great artist, a great musical muse, a great musical sibyl will come with him to guide him through his years. Not only because of his need, but this is a service performed by the guardian angels because in their coming and helping the individual to fulfill his own greatness or his own needs, they are also contributing to the glory of the world and all that is necessary for the perfection of human endeavor. Whoever the guardian angel was that watched over Michelangelo served all mankind. But the ancients believed that definitely this was a spirit and that this spirit would only come when truth prevailed, that it would only come and give beauty when integrity was there. I can't remember his name, but there's the psychiatrist who was working with schizophrenics, and finally he addressed that they're actually hearing voices like from outside, not inside their head. And when he started addressing these entities as if they were real, really weird things started happening, uh, supernatural. Uh, and these schizophrenics, they're not here, they're not making this up in their head. They are being invaded by what you know, the Arabs would call the jinn or we might call demons. So I'm not saying there aren't demons and angels. I'm saying what the Bible is calling angels is something else in other teachings. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Got it. And since we're on the subject, what's your take on, uh, the, you know, entities or demons or for lack of a better way to say it? Maybe we have to start with good and evil. <laughs> yeah, well. I mean, this is what's this is why I like the near death experiences. Uh, my friend Felix, you know, her she went to a seance with her friend whose boyfriend died. Um, they're sitting around a room, and it, it, she's this experience affected her so much that she looks into this stuff constantly. You know, we're always sending each, stuff, each other stuff. Um, th th there were weird lights and flashes in the room, noises. There's an audio tape. He, the boyfriend, came to her and spoke to her. And it's on, they got an audio recording of it. 
Now, not everyone in the room heard it, but Felix was sitting right next to her and heard the dude's voice. He told her he, he loved her, gave her a kiss like she felt it. They like whatever this is, it's in the room. Now, some people, there are people out there who say when you die uh, from the physical, your spirit or some will call it soul. There's a difference. We can get into that later. Yes. Goes into the first layer of etheric and and can hang around for four to six weeks, usually wanting to see who came to your funeral and say goodbye and this, that, and the other. And then if it hangs around too long, and eventually that should fade, and they, they're ready to cross up to the lower astral, middle astral, higher astral, mental. Guys, the soul lifts out of the body. When the soul lifts out of the body, it doesn't cross over right away. And crossing over means simply like to walk into another dimension, walk into their light and go into the other side, which is the afterlife, right? Most souls hang out for like four to six weeks after death. You know, they just kind of like want to see what's going on. Or if they, it was a very abrupt death, they will, maybe they have unfinished business. They want to make sure they say goodbye to everyone. Some souls like to see who's going to be at the funeral because who would not, right? Mm, yeah. And then eventually they pass. Now what happened is during that period of time when a soul is earthbound, this is what I call an earthbound soul. I don't call them ghosts because again, there's so much like, bullshit out there. Like when a soul is earthbound, it's still very locked into earth frequencies, like into human frequencies, right? So it's the closest that it would be to be able to communicate and interact with the human world. And so this is why like if somebody passed, I mean, I know your father passed, right? And you might have been very young, you might not remember, but usually people will say that I swear to God, I felt them, I felt them in the room with them. I know they were there. And it's because they are, they are for a short period of time. And then eventually that connection they have with earth frequencies or human frequencies fades. And so their ability to like hug you or be there with you fades away. And then they have two choices. They can either choose to stay, which is not good, or they can choose to cross over. And when a soul crosses over, the way they show up is very different. But some of them hang around. That's what you'd call ghosts. Like they, even though they lose connection, they still hang around. That's one belief and idea, and I'm up for it because there are so many seance and ghost stories and pe people who have these experiences that I'm like, what's going on here? I don't, again, I don't know. I've never died. I've never had a near-death experience. I've never been to a seance, but I've seen enough of these damn stories to know something else is going on. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying. That's why I'm into this is like, what is going on? <laughs> what, who's talking to them? something's happening now there are other eastern philosophies that say when you die that's that you're you, you are everything and everything is you a blade of grass a tree a dog whatever just like when you were born you didn't know where you came from they're saying when you die you shut your eyes and the next thing that is alive or born is having the i'm it experience just like you are you're you know it's an illusion almost like the the brahma they call it like there's the one over soul and the only thing the one can't experience is not the one. You need time and space to, you know, there's, there's no time and space or experience in the one. So the only thing the one could be lonely for is what is it like to not be the one? And then you would need time and space and birth as a, a trillion gazillion things, right? To experience that. That's another Eastern philosophy too. And I'm not saying either one is right or wrong, but that takes away the feeling. All of it's having the I'm it, like a spider or a dog or you or a blade of grass. As far as they're concerned, I'm it. You know, but there's an idea that you feel like you're it because the one doesn't want to, it already knows what it's like to not be you. The whole point of the one splintering into the everything is to feel what it's like to not be the one. And so it has to be an illusion. You don't want to play this game, right? If you think, if you know the game, <laughs> if the one's trying to fool itself to experience the many, the last thing it wants to do is, oh, I know I'm the one though. So then it doesn't get the experience. You right. Know? Right. So it's, it's like the one is at play here. And that's why people are like, Every, it's horrible. If there was a God, it wouldn't let babies burn in fires and this and that. And you're like, yeah, because if it's the whole thing's a joke, there are no babies to burn in fires up in the one, <laughs> you know, it's like, of course it would have all of it because if it all goes back to the one, then it's not really real. It's real here. It feels real, but it's not, you know? So th that's one idea. And a lot of people don't like that idea. 
especially people who have near-death experiences because they're like, no, I went into the next thing and there was a light, the white magnetic light, and I was greeted by this or I was sitting by a stream or something happened. And what no one ever asked them is like, they never, they say, I wasn't me. They say, I, I rose out of my body and I was looking down and I, I was felt free for once. And I was one with everything, but I could still see me down there. And they never ask them, were you male or female? Nobody ever asked this question. While you were up there, were you, did, do you remember being male or female, what you were? Because the question is, are there layers? Were you gone long enough? Does something happen if that does happen, right? If you had a near-death experience, well, you're back. So you couldn't have been dead that long or else you wouldn't be, your body would have decayed. You know what I mean? So you're like, you clearly came back within either one to 20 hours or whatever. So you weren't gone that long. But, you know, is it possible that when you're gone that long, something else happens and something else, you know, do you, do you start going into different realms or dimensions or or layers and and that's what i don't know that's what i'm asking is a what's the difference between a near-death experience and a long death experience right let's, let's, let's say a year right the, the, there might be a difference between an hour and a year mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or is there Right. And just to go back to something you were saying about the the illusion of it all, and that's in some ways where it doesn't mean the philosophy is wrong or that that's a wrong thought, but a lot of people have used it for the wrong reason. And, mm. that's, and that's to dissociate from suffering. Because yeah. even though it's an illusion that the baby's burning, then if you can't feel that, then you're not alive. If, if, it, if that doesn't cause suffering in you and, and make you want to remedy the suffering in some way, because that, that's where people have taken it. They've, they've let it put them in apathy so they don't care about anything, right? Yeah. And literally cooperating with that force of death in the process. So I just always feel like I need Well, that's to pretty interesting because the other thing the one can't feel is pain because if there's no time and space and physical experience in the one, it can't know pain either. But it needs pain to know non-pain and love to know hate. And, you know, so there's that. Now you start getting into hermeticism with duality. That's the idea that in this realm, all is duality. There's no hot and cold. There's just temperature, you know, so you don't see one as evil and one is good. Yeah, this but, I do not buy. I just don't buy it. Right. It's, it's really hard to buy. It's, it's like hard to buy. Like we think good and evil, right? It's We think there has to be good and evil. But how can you have good without evil to know what good is? You see, and just I, back, I, and just back to the that the one can't feel pain. The pain came from the one. So I disagree that there's uh, that. I think God personally is 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 extremely sensitive not to his own pain, to but to all the pain that. You know, that it's not a <clears throat> look on, oh, you'll be fine or you'll be dead or you'll be, you know, it's just one mm -hmm. life and you got a hundred more to come or a thousand more, a hundred thousand, whatever it is. I, I I really, that's not my personal experience. Um, also, the like that, that that good and evil are, are a package deal. You couldn't have good without evil. I totally, totally went down this rabbit hole so big. And while I don't, you know, have any religious had to hang this on whatsoever. My experience is that uh, we have a pure source. Yeah. Where we come from, right? That that doesn't have, you know, and, and you take purity and you turn it upside down and you invert it and, and you mangle it. And then you get some expression that's not our true nature, but yet it was made of nature. So anyway, it can go in circles from there, can't it? Well, you and I talked about that at the pool in Acapulco. Like Bill Gates came from nature. Right. George Soros, the Jesuits, who you know, whoever, whoever you want to pin all this on. Like I said to you, am I Bill Gates? Because he came from the same nature I did. He, he might be acting evil as far as society is concerned from morals versus ethics or even ethics and morals. But nature made that guy. You know, nature, if if nature didn't want Bill Gates behaving like that, it would have made it so he can't. But you got now we're getting the free will and you're also getting into the idea of God. 
There's a lot of people who look and say, my dad used to say this to me, look at this, son. It's no accident. This is so intelligent, this whole thing. There has to be a creator. That's a Western idea. The Eastern idea is that the creation itself, magnetism, is intelligent. The creation, you say, well, okay, okay, dad, how are you breathing? I know you can control your breathing. How do you blink? Tell me biochemically and physically all the synapses that go out. Tell me how you blink. I don't know. Tell me everything when you move your hand like this to catch a ball. Tell me how you do it. I don't know. You don't even have a manual. It does it. There's <laughs> That's another Eastern philosophy. There is isness. The creation itself is the mind of God fractured into in between God or external of God having a giant play at play in isness. And there are horrible things in the play <laughs> because it's trying to experience everything it can experience. And this is really hard for us as Westerners to wrap our head around. Let me get to some of your quotes uh, that are out in the, in the press. The one um, where you say there is no God, or at least that's what primary headlines sort of read, there is no God. Could you expand on that? Are you saying that, uh, that there is no God outside of creation? per se? Certainly, I am saying that there is no creator. Creation itself is enough unto itself. It needs no outside agency to create it. At the moment you accept an outside agency to create it, you fall into a vicious circle because the reasoning is that how existence can be there without being created by someone. That is the reasoning of all the religions. If you accept their reasoning, then the question arises, who created the God? And if God can be there without being created, then what is the problem? then existence can be there without being created. You accept principally that something can be there without being created. And again, that's why I put a disclaimer earlier. I'm not saying I believe the West or the Eastern version or whatever. I'm saying I've been studying both of them for a long time and I understand where they're each coming from. And, and we wouldn't still be talking about this if they had figured this out. <laughs> you know, exactly. Exactly. No, and, and, and the discussion does at some point go in circles, right? Like that, that there's, there's, you always bump up against the grand mystery and can't say anything. This was actually one of my revelations in preparing for an archipelago with one of my talks, the uh, archetypes of controlled op, because, you know, it's one thing to just go and, and spew a bunch of, uh, archetype patterns and even a bunch of names and stuff, but that's not to me the point that's, that's, you know, people are doing that, but how could I, you know, I ask myself, how could I go deeper and actually benefit people, not just so they know who the, the scary ones are. And, but because at the end of the day, you have two big qualities going on. One is certainty and one is uncertainty. Yeah. And, and we're back to what we, I think started talking about was the masculine feminine. It's inside of all of us. And the masculine says, I know. And the feminine says, I don't know. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I think what I like about your hero's journey, you know, oh, yeah. I think the, the hero's journey is great because that that's what they call the sun's path through the, uh, you know, every day and every month and every year, starting with Aries or which would be our head because you can take the whole Zodiac and start from head and going down. Giant being, right? On a horizontal vertical plane because <clears throat> your heart is radiating horizontally. When people meet you and they've got a radiating heart, it's radiating horizontally. That's what it's doing. It's radiating in every direction, but it is a plane horizontally. And then you have a vertical ecliptic going through you as well. And all the Zodiac signs go through your body. Aries is the cerebrum, Taurus is the cerebellum, the cerebellum, the motor, the motor nerves, Aries are the sensory nerves, oh my the brain, God. so that's why the Taurus is strong, right, it's, it's, they're strong, right, so it's, it's because it's the motor nerves, they, they own that system. Gemini, the twins, there's your twins, twin lungs, 
Cancer is the chest. Leo is the heart, the lion heart. Virgo is the belly. Libra, the, the, the scales are the two kidneys, yin and yang. Scorpio is the generative system. <laughs> Ovaries and testes. Hell yeah. Sagittarius is the hips. Hippo means horse. Hips. There you go. Everybody's walking on their Sagittarius hippos. Capricorn's the knees. Aquarius is the shins. And the two feet are the two fish of Pisces. Your body is Adam Cadmon. It is an ideal blueprint from the transcendence which comes out in atoms, red shift, blue shift, and manifests in this plane called the Earth, which is a theater. They're calling it the hero's path. And again, like you're saying, you get the choice here, which is great. You know, this gets down to free will. <laughs> you do, do you want to be what we call bad? And you, you do know what you would consider right and wrong. You, you, you do know that, or at least most of us think so. But then again, you could ask a psychopath like Bill Gates. He, he might really believe there's too many people in the world and that the world's going to die if we don't kill off 90. You know, for all we know, it, it's like Alan Watts, the philosopher, used to say, the lettuce farmer doesn't like slugs because the lettuce farmer plants his lettuce two feet apart and sells them for money. So when slugs start eating his lettuce, he wants to kill them because they're no good. But in nature, lettuce grow in patches and the slugs eat the outside lettuce so they don't all starve each other to death for water. So you're looking at a matter of perspective. For him, a slug sucks. For nature, slugs are essential to lettuce to keep surviving. You know, So again, we get into this, how zoomed out are you in your consciousness? Are we so zoomed in? to our beliefs and I'm right and that's wrong and I know good from evil and all that. And that's where you get into different hermetic and Gnostic beliefs that like, if you zoomed out, is there good and evil? And mm -hmm. it's impossible to see their perspective. If you're staying zoomed in, you can't, you can't even comprehend it. I like to entertain both ideas myself. Right. I, I don't behave badly because I don't want to, I don't think it's cool to other people. And there are people who say they come back from their near death experiences and had a life review. Like they, they were shown everything they did good and bad and not, not, and they felt what it felt like, but they were also shown when you did, when you said this to her, she turned around and did this at, you know, at the grocery store, <laughs> like they see a spider's web, they describe it where they see their, every thought and action shot out into a web of the all. This this gets described a lot, you know. So I don't I don't know if that happens or not because not everyone who has a near death experience comes back with that thing, but a lot do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The wake up calls. Life is full of them, and it might not be an outright threat to your life, like you get hit by a bus or a threatening illness, but you get some kind of board in the face that interrupts the patterns, and if the patterns have been more unconscious and resulting in pain in yourself and pain in the others, and like you're saying, the ripple effect, then there's no getting out of that pain. That pain is stored in your system as, as um, you know, nothing more than held energy. But if you don't have the um, strength and the bravery to go and feel that pain, to me, it's the bravest thing ever to feel that pain, then life is going to present some kind of circumstance where you have to feel that pain, where you can't get out of that pain. Right. And so there's something I, I talk about like harvesting energy that, that is, is stuck in the unconscious and, and it, it energy um, in my experience wills to move and to do everything that supports life. That's that's what its true nature is, but in our in our disnatured world in our disnatured lives, then we're seeing all kinds of other results. Well, yeah, there are also you know there's a debate. A lot of people are like you need to get rid of your mind and ego, and then you will transcend and you can get out of here. You can go out of Earth and go up to these other astral realms or other dimensions, and it's going to be all great and dandy, you know. And then there are other beliefs like no you're this is where you're going to keep coming back and back now you could reincarnate into an animal nature if you if your soul uh 
is being de the lower there's in in this philosophy there are two layers of soul there's the perishable lower one and the imperishable spiritual one we have two souls all of us who love the good slash god same word we have two souls one is called the param atma and one is called the jiva atma the jiva atma is your individual soul and it is one one hundredth the breadth of a hair divided again by another one hundredth and that is the size of your soul, your jiva. Jiva means entity, living entity. And you have a jiva atma. Atma is an anagram for atom. Atom is the same word as Adam. Then we have the param atma, which is the super soul, which is four inches long. It's a Vishnu or a Jesus. Jesus is the super soul. And both of these souls are in your heart. Param Atma, which is about four inches high near your heart. And this one is what makes us different and special to these other service to self entities. They have destroyed this soul and detached themselves from this soul ages and eons ago. And they have infiltrated all the levels and branches of government and all of these gangs. These are controlled by demon entities and they create further grand grandiose entities called egregores. If you keep acting like a douchebag down here in an animal, you will come back as an animal. You know, we stand upright and the birds are very smart because our spine is erect. We are an antenna taking energy. The other animals are on all fours sideways. They don't have a chance to, to right themselves and say right and wrong. They are stuck in the lower chakras because they don't have a dipole to bring the energy up from the bottom. This is your hero's journey of your Aries, the sword, your spinal column, right? You've got the fire on top and you got the fire down in the Scorpio and that's a water sign, but fire can put out water, but hot fire can boil water and water can put out fire, right? So there's, a, there's, there's an idea that you just keep coming back here, but in lower and lower forms and, and, and you'll never get back to this form. There are ideas that you're purifying your soul or your mind or personality through experience here so that you can go in a higher frequency and exist in another realm, you know, outside of here. And again, I don't know which is which. I don't know. So that's why I like to really study this, because there are all these crazy ideas that every person you talk to has a completely different one. You, you ask like a million people, what's the soul? And you'll get like a million different answers or maybe none. Most people are like, I don't know. I never thought about it. You know? and you're like, okay. So that's why I find the, the subject really fascinating. But yeah, do, do, like in the ancient Irish, I can tell you here quick, I was going to show it, but I'll just say there's an idea in the old Gnostic that the soul is the ego, the self or the personality that's being built, right? And as we talked about, there's a lot of people who are meditating and trying to do Eastern philosophy saying like, you need to get rid of the self and the ego. But like Walter Russell and Matt Presti was saying, the mind is the mind of God. It's your ego and self is God from the still white magnetic light down into here. And in the ancient teachings, mind has a dual nature. There's an upper permanent nature, like I said, a spiritual nature, and a lower perishable nature, you could call your lower chakras. So again, it's getting out of your animal desires into your spiritual desires. Um, so you have spiritual soul and, and animal soul, and they only exist in the astral or the lower spiritual planes. They, they, According to them, there are higher planes that they don't exist in. The highest plane being mind. So this is when you get into alchemy, like Bear Lando and I have talked about before together. Everything in alchemy and alchemical theory, it comes from mind and precipitates down into physicality. Um, but the idea is that the soul is down here, which in ego, self and personality, gaining knowledge and wisdom and in incarnations until the ego has enough of being animal like and completes the spiritual body where it can then go back up to the higher realms where e where soul doesn't exist. Interesting. So one idea. <laughs> that's yeah, an yeah, idea. One idea. Exactly. Yeah. No, I'm not. Uh, I, I'm not challenging. Although I did my talk at Anarchapoco on Ascension myth busting. So yeah. I have an obvious bias in that title right there. Well, I like it. Yeah. Say 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 to people listening what you and I talked about because you don't you don't buy into that at all. I think it, there is a lot of traps in it. Even even if they're it, like what you're saying is true. The the 
um, by making your goal to ascend and to leave the body behind. First of all, that's how I got sick with a stage four lymphoma, right? I was, I was doing ascension spirituality. I was going to India every year. I was meditating my way out of my physicality every single day. And then all of a sudden it's nearly dead. <laughs> it's like, right. oh, what happened? Oh I'm my trying God. to leave my body. And sure enough, sure enough, it's leaving, <laughs> me. it's leaving me. So yeah, it made me do a real U-turn. Like, no, this is, this is and getting out of the body is, is a bad goal. And, but getting in, into embodiment, finding spirit in the, um, you know, like, because when we think of spirit and matter, we're having two ideas, two concepts and, and as a result, it's like they're as if two different things, but we don't know. And I started to talk about it like the spirit has a love affair with the body that there, there's, it, you know, it's, it's so, it's so, they're so close. They're, they're one, just like a marriage, right? Yeah. The Easterns are angry with me because they think I am materialist. And are they right? No. You're not materialistic? No, not in their sense. And the Western people, particularly the materialist, the communist, they are angry with me because I'm bringing a spiritualism. My approach is that man is both together. This existence is not split into matter and spirit. This existence is one organic unity. Just as your soul and your body is an organic unity, your soul cannot exist without your body, and your body cannot be alive without the soul. And I look at it like a marinade, you know, when you marinate vegetables or meat, whatever your thing is, meat or vegetables, yes. when you marinate it, it's interlaced with the vegetables or the meat. It's that they're together. They're not separate. And you know, I've got a video of, you know, where they're using a, a Kirlian energy motion picture photography to see what you call auras. I could probably screen share it and show people. Please do. Would you like to see it? The, yeah. the other thing is I just want to tell people that in, I won't get into like the Irish versus the Greek, the Catholic church moved all this to Greek, but the word soul comes from the word Jonas, I O H N N E S or John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. And it means fluids of the body, not the ego or spiritual man. It means fluids. So when the body dies, the fluids die and the man loses his soul when he loses his body because they're physical. Right. So there's another teaching where soul is not, between spirit and physical at all, it's physical. Like you're saying, it's interlaced with the meat, you know what I mean? Right. So like you said, yeah, if you're trying to transcend your soul and your mind and ego, well, your mind and ego are also what's dictating what your body wants to do. That's what they tell you. Get into Aries, the cerebram, the lamb or ram of God. In the cer and, and that's Moses, he blows the ram's horn, the lamb of God, the ram, and says, quit worshiping the golden calf, which is Taurus, the cerebellum, which is the motor skills. He's saying, quit quit doing because you're horny and you're hungry and you like to like me, you like to smoke and your, your lower brain's just doing whatever you want like a dog. Stop it. Get, you know, get into your upper mind and transcend that. Quit worshiping the golden calf. Well, that's your mind. And that's coming from, like uh, Matt Presti would say, the, the mind of God. You're trying to transcend into a spiritual kind of being. I will, Let me show this real quick. I think I can do this. Uh, we practice this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Present. Here we go. Every, every Present. <laughs> Share screen. Uh, so far, I'm doing pretty good. Yeah. Tire screen. Click that. That. All right, here we go. I can put my mic down by the screen. The following film shows the human energy field radiating outward from the body. It dynamically changes based on the physical conditions, the feeling states, the motivations of the person, in interaction with energy radiation from objects and living things. The existence of the human energy field, or the aura, 
was validated and studied by over 12 years of high frequency recordings. This film shows the field not ordinarily seen, but now visible. Like all living things, this little dog has a sizable radiant field, even when he sits quietly. Notice now as he greets his master, the obvious love and affection between them increases the dynamic radiation from their bodies, even the dog's tail and the man's head. No wonder so many people have pets who give them pleasure and provide a vital field of energy to interact with. Wherever there is motion in the universe, there is increased flow in the field that humans interact with. See the explosive activity from the waves and from his body. Also, the electromagnetic field of the body is negatively charged or ionized, as are waves or tumbling water, which further expands and heightens his field, giving a physical exuberance and emotional excitement. No wonder that a day at the beach is so exhilarating and vitalizing. We all love a babbling brook and the freshness of outdoor vegetation and mountains. Most of us believe that it is relaxation and beauty which refreshes us. From our research, we have discovered that living plants in rarefied atmosphere provide a richer field of negative ions, which heightens and replenishes our own energy field. Notice that the man's field becomes light in color and high in frequency. It sparkles and radiates some distance from his body. See that as the child moves into the mother's field, the affection between them changes the overall field to a pink color. Individuals' fields blend and enhance when there is a warm, caring relationship. These energy fields are the largest and the whitest that we have shown. She is Omi. On the breath inhalation, the radiant field diminishes, and on exhalation, it expands and envelops the child. We have known for a long time that Gregorian chants, alming, humming, singing, and whistling create an energy which perks up emotions and brings an expanded consciousness. So again, whether you want to call that soul or spirit or what that auric field, that is interlaced with the physical. It's, it's the waves and the plants that are, you know, and the other child you see what I'm saying? It's it's to me. I'm with you. It's it's all entwined. So why would you want to transcend that? <laughs> That's I mean, what's the point of being here? Is what I'm saying. Right. Is that how you feel too? Is that is that what you mean? Yeah, that was my U-turn exactly. That uh, that this is very important. That this isn't just a meat suit that we slough off and go on to a, a more real kind of a life. Um, that that this is the real deal, and we. I, we don't know what's beyond it for, I think, a good reason so that we do, you know, full on play the game if there's a game <laughs> to play. Yeah. Through. Well, that is the thing, you know, with a lot of her medicine, there's there's different Gnostic sects too as well. But some some of these teachings, it's a meat suit and you're and you're like, oh, it's just a meat suit. Don't worry. You can get another meat suit and another meat suit. And it's like, yeah, OK, but. It, there's other teachings where it's it's not a meat suit. It's a meat suit interlaced with spirit and soul, if you want to call it that. Uh, so the meat suit is important because if the point of the meat suit is to learn experiences through your deeds and your thoughts to teach a, a higher spirit body, to, to evolve a spirit body, that's one teaching is the point of the meat suit is to have these interactions and they are uh, affecting that radiant field she's showing to to make a higher spirit to go into a realm where they don't want dickheads and murderers and charles manson and liars and thieves and cheats <laughs> you're, like, you're like what makes you think you're going to be down here as ted bundy the serial killer and they're going to want you up in another realm if that's really what's going on you know or or even back here as another human so of course it's it has to be intertwined i think but again, these are, you know, I'm not saying I'm right or wrong. These are beliefs. Right, right, exactly. And in the realm of beliefs, and we're always 
in a in a temporal realm, a temporary realm, because that, that's growing up in a big family. I I would see how people's beliefs would change every single time we got together. They'd be have some new belief, and and they would you know put their fist on the table and they they argue for their belief, and I'd be going like, but you did that exactly with some other belief last time that's not there anymore, and you know. So I just I just really saw how fluid that environment is, and. Um, you know, our, and and then you got code triple seven there. Like, you know, belief is the enemy of knowing. Yeah. Right. What's your take on that? Yeah, because what if you're wrong? What if what you believe isn't true? <laughs> you know, right. I used to believe a lot of things that aren't true anymore. <laughs> Even like you said, you watch my Atlantis Rising series. Half the shit in there I don't believe anymore because I came across new information. So. If I'm there stuck believing that, you're going to end up doing what everyone's doing and fight to the death, like religions. You know, I've I've had, you know, arguments. I'm not ragging on Christianity or whatever. I have different beliefs, but I have a, a great friend. We're still great friends, but we have, like, heated discussions about that. She's like, Jesus is God incarnated, and all you have to do is say, I believe, I accept you, and then I'll go to heaven. And you're like, well, why didn't Ted Bundy or John Wayne Gacy just say that first, then go kill 50 kids and rape them? And they're still going to heaven because they already accepted them. <laughs> You're like, Dude, I can't. I have trouble buying that. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean. It's like, but what you can do, what I, where we agree at, is no matter what a dickhead you've been at any time, you can just say, "I will no longer do this." Exactly. exactly. That is redemption. It, you don't have to suffer and punish yourself, uh, you know, for what you did before. Just nope. stop and do something different. Yeah. And in fact, the suffering and the self-beating is a way out of the healing because it's easier to beat yourself than it is to feel the pain that's trapped in your body. Yeah. What do they call? Is that called Im immolation? Or what do you call it? self -immol What's that called? Self-flagellation, I guess, is one self-flagellation. Yeah, right. Immol yeah, right. Yeah. So, oh, immolation yeah. set yourself on fire, I think. Yeah, oh, okay. That's, that's a little thing. extreme. <laughs> that's yeah. a little too much. <laughs> But yeah, I'm with you. You know, that that would be the point in either philosophy of learning here is, okay, you've, you've done some terrible things. Just stop. Just stop. Exactly. <laughs> you know? I, mean, I never had the word repent in my vocabulary until the last four years. But now I completely get it. It's like, yeah, as soon as you realize, then then stop it. This, but but here's the, the thing, and that's where a lot of my work comes in, is that people will hear that, just stop, oh, sure. Like, you know, I'd love to stop the madness. I'd love to stop doing the wrong things. But here I go again, doing it again. And there's there's a pattern established, and it's motivated by the unconscious that's giving instructions that you can't not listen to. Because they're telling you, especially when it comes to life and death, they're telling you, you will die otherwise. And if you never make the inquiry to study the program and see like, oh, it's lying. <laughs> it's lying. It's telling me things that aren't actually in reality true. And, and like you keep pointing to, to Aries, we have this higher mind that can see through. If you engage it and you use it, then you can look at a program and say, actually, I'm not going to take instructions from that AI anymore. This is, right. this is my life. I'm, I'm the decider. Well, that is actually what the both Hermetic and Gnostic ancients are talking about. They're talking about transcending the lower need for all the physical and the selfishness to, so you can become like that and say, no, I don't have to do this. It's a choice. I might even suffer like a lot of people who are, you know, in the truth movement over the, the boogeyman were on YouTube, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, there were a lot of people who just said, no, I'm not going to put that on my face and put, you know, that in me. And they lost their jobs and they lost their friends and family. And, you know, and they said, yeah, I lost everything, but I'm still not going to do it because I'm going to be in the higher mind, you know. So that is exactly what it's about. And it's not making you any better. Like, that's what I like about I, I haven't read your book and I'm going to. But so like you're saying, we're all on the hero's journey, but you're not just the, you know, the hero or the alchemist or whatever. You're you're a bit of all of it at different times. And that's astrology as well, you know. I, um, Paracelsus, you know, he said, "Know that the, know that the philosopher has power over the stars, and not the stars over him or her." Yeah. And I, I say astrologer because I know I'm a Virgo, 
I know that I have positive aspects and negative aspects, and I, I, I made a list of them, and I know which ones I'm over, I've overcome of my negative ones. I haven't overcome any of the positive ones, and the, the joke is they're there to help you overcome the negative ones. Your same signs, positives, are there to help you have the tools to overcome the negative, which could be likened to the hero's journey. It's exactly right. how I look at it. It's exactly yeah. how I look at it, right? Exactly. Yeah. So uh, what, you did my quiz before. I did, yeah. Me, and uh, you got the rebel archetype, which I, I got the rebel. I thought I was an alchemist. I was <laughs> right, right. And and just to reflect. So tell me what, about the rebel. Yeah, tell me about me. Yeah. And to preempt that, just to say that we are all archetypes on the hero's journey. And the reason that at, at the same time, not even that we just pass through and and uh, we're, you know, little this and little that, I believe astrology is the same. Like we always have all of the planets in, you know, whether it's influencing us or we're influencing them or this exchange relationship of energy going on. So, you know, the, the quiz for people who haven't done it or have done it already and want to redo it, it's still relevant because it's showing you where are you defaulting? Where are you likely to find the most amount of lost energy, the most amount of purposeful hero's journey energy that will fuel you and will also take you down the the two in one right if, if here and now yeah that's the thing because with the astrology there are some who say well you'll incarnate as a different sign next time because it, you know maybe you learned your lesson of what a virgo needs to learn you need to learn the patience and blah 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 and next time you're going to need to learn this, that, and the other. What I like about yours is like, you can learn that, but then you go into the next leg of the journey. Like you don't seem to get off the wheel. You know what I mean? Like there's no getting out of it. You, you learn it. And then it's like, right next. That's like, you never get out of school or do you, do you ever finish your hero's journey or is it? Not in my experience. No, it's, no, it's round and round to go. Yeah. It's, it's a spiral, not a, not a round in a circle, but in a spiral that either goes up or goes down. And then that's the trap that we think, oh, well, just keep going up, which is better than down. <laughs> right? yeah. It is better than down. We like that. But uh, but the, to me, the whole purpose of the journey and knowing it and knowing yourself is so you can get off the map. And uh, and this I, I'm now able to articulate, thanks to my, Matt Presti, one of those talks around the pool in the morning, and uh, and how you know we're, we're chasing frequency. We're chasing that high thing because we like it so much better than the low thing. And yeah. what that does is it keeps us infinitely on the spiral. And then the point of the spiral itself is to get off the spiral, to use the spiral, to see it as our, um, it's like our palette. It's our, it's our um, um, control board. It's our, like God gave us all of this, you know, color and experience that we can create at will and but if we're completely trapped inside of it and we never get out to the to the place that's no frequency that's no you know it's it god isn't on the map and i think that's that's the big mistake that's getting made they're chasing they think they're chasing god but they're they're really just winding themselves up and then the short version of my talk from inokoboko is that as you as you go up you also are going down but if you think you're so high, you're going to suppress the crap out of the down and pretend that that's not happening. I mean, that is also hermeticism. That's duality right there. You know, <laughs> you can pretend it's not, but it is. Yeah. It is. But, you know, are you saying like go up to the white still mind of God, as Matt was saying, or something like, because to me, it's like the only point of overcoming uh, the, the astro, let's say your astrological negatives. It's for right here and now it's so that you have a better time here right now in the physical and you stop being uh, hurting other people. Like to me, the idea is not to get off the wheel, but to make this heaven on earth instead of thinking, oh, if I do this, I'm going to get a ticket to heaven. To me, it's like, well, if I do this, I'm going to make heaven around me. And, you know, I, I see it like that. Right, right. And when I say get off the wheel, it's not a destination. It's like every every rung of the hero's journey, you know, the child seems like lowly compared to the king or the alchemist. That is the, the so-called end of the journey. But it's not like that. The child can go right to heaven 
at any at any point. The rebel can go right to heaven. The warrior can go right to heaven. The nurturer goes right to heaven. So it's to me, you know, I, I just um, <clears throat> I was praying to God to one day and I'm like, why to create all the suffering? Because there's suffering inherent in every stage of the hero's journey on the whole scale of emotion, which is a similar kind of a mirrored experience. And and then I just heard this death, uh, Beth. That's that's me. <laughs> that, <laughs> we heard Freudians. Right yes, exactly, I know. <laughs> and, and, uh, so I heard God say, "Beth, it's they're all doors to freedom, right?" And to me, that's that's our inheritance. Not that we go to freedom and and numb out and bliss out. That's actually more ascension. But that we have this context of freedom that we can know and live and breathe freedom. That's not separate from like, oh, now I need compassion because there's there's pain in me or someone else oh well that's part of my palette or now i need um you know if you're in the rebel well now i need the warrior i need to start building and get serious and and what's the infrastructure and what are the goals and you know so it's it's all ways for us to know it's for us to know freedom right see what i noticed is like when i i, I had to think again after talking to matt about the seven deadly sins versus the seven heavenly virtues, which are to overcome. I started thinking about it and he said, oh, the still white magnetic light of God, which is still, it's between breaths. It's the space between things is, is God. And when you breathe in and stop, there's God. And you breathe out and stop, there it is. And I started looking at the seven deadly sins and most of them are doing. They're, they're doing things, usually negative things for yourself and hurt others. Most of the seven uh, heavenly virtues were being, mm. e except for sloth was the only one that's not really doing in, in the sins, but sloth is actually doing nothing, <laughs> not enough, you know, and uh, charity was the opposite of that, which is the only virtue that was doing, but actually you're relieving yourself because you feel good. You raise your vibration or, you know, you raise your spirit by giving and helping. So, and actually others don't have to do as much because you're doing for them. So you allow them a space of being. So I started looking at it like that, like what is ascension? I'm like, is it a state of more being than doing? And then you start to get into these East, maybe these Eastern guys have it right. They're like, stop and smell the flowers. If you, you know, you're doing yoga and meditating and goat yoga and all this because you think that you need to be better, but if you knew how to be better, you'd be better already. So what you, what your problem is, you don't accept yourself 100% as you. You're trying to be something you aren't when really the joke is you're perfect. <laughs> and once you realize that, then you might do yoga because you want to. You don't have to meditate, but you'll stop swimming to get to the other side of the shore and you'll start swimming to experience the state of swimming in the in the water and feel the waves and the joy of of just being not you know you, you can you know like you might like washing the dishes because you can get into washing the dishes the best you can wash a dish you know what i mean so they might be onto something there as well too people are always asking is it necessary to know yoga breathing is it necessary to do tai chi is it necessary to, uh, I don't know what the hell, to be psychoanalyzed? And I would ask, necessary for what? Where are you going? What do you want? Yes, sure. If you want to get to New York, it's necessary to take the highway. But where are you going? What do you mean necessary? Well, is it necessary for becoming a Buddha? Anybody want to be a Buddha? <laughs> you know what it means to be a Buddha? How do you know you want to be a Buddha if you don't know what a Buddha is? People think, well, it would be nice to be to have peace of mind, to be serene, to be calm, to be undisturbed by this, that and the other. But you see, so long as you make all those things objects of desire, you are defining yourself as lacking. And a person who is looking for peace is obviously in turmoil. A person who is looking to end conflict is in conflict. 
And so the more you strive to stop the interior commotions, the more you are stirring them up. You are smoothing the waters with flat irons. So then we might, uh, then comes up the people who say, all right, now, if you are going to tell us that uh, meditation is not necessary, that it's all here and now, uh, then why do you meditate? Why do you have uh, religion at all? Why do you have rites? Why do you chant? Why do you do this, that and the other? Why do you even talk about it? And my answer to that is, uh, there is no good reason for it whatsoever. <laughs> this is a form of joyous energy. And it's a form of dance. Uh, it's a groovy thing to do. There are all kinds of groovy things to do and to everybody according to his taste. You, you can make anything whatsoever, any human activity, into meditation simply by being with it and doing it completely to do it. In other words, when you're, say, swimming, if you really enjoy swimming, you're not swimming to get to the other side of a river or to swim so many yards or any competing with yourself or with other people like that, you're swimming to experience the water rippling past you. The floating sensation. Uh, to lie on your back and look at the blue sky and the gulls circling. You are doing that. Every moment of it, you are simply absorbed in this ripply, luminous world, looking at the patterns and the sh shifting net of sunlight underneath the sand way down. Yeah, so interesting. And then right away, I think about growing. And when you look at nature, it's tasked to grow. That's, you know, there's no blade of grass that doesn't have that, that job on its hands. And I think it's the same with us that, you know, as soon as you grow into more acceptance in your life, you're also going to see there's a there's an even deeper place that yes, acceptance is is necessary to to not degrade and and put down and disapprove of all of this beautiful creation that you are. And there's um and there's a deeper place to see that from as well by letting acceptance itself go. Thinking that yeah. The opposite of acceptance would be that you don't accept it, but it's not like that by, by going through the door of acceptance and finding freedom on the other side and finding the energy is not drawn in that. It's actually uh, a well of energy in that, right? Right. So coming to the source of it and then, and then the growing that's, that's painful, right? People don't generally like that. A lot of people don't, like to learn. They don't like to explore. They don't like to take on a new idea. I see you doing it pretty much every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a rare quality. Even, but it's that. it's the you know yeah it, it shouldn't be painful. That's the thing. It, you know you need to step out of your comfort zone. If if you enjoy that process, it's not it's painful because you're waiting for the 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 carrot at the end you know if i do this uh if i just do this i'll get this and you never get it even when you do get it it it, it sucks you know you're like the the whole joy is it, it wouldn't be painful if you enjoyed doing it and and change your mindset around do you like heaven and hell uh, do you believe in actual physical or spiritual heaven and hell because like you're saying Oh, you did this in that lifetime and you're going to hell forever. That's it. You can't get out. You can't get out. No, no, no. It's forever. Well, there's no growth or change. So what's the point? Right. And the same when you get to heaven, there's, I'm just going to sit in the clouds with Jimi Hendrix. That bore the shit out of me in about a month. <laughs> <laughs> I'm begging to come back here. You know what I mean? Oh. I'm like, I got to go sit with my grandma, man. I used to have to sit with her at Thanksgiving and put up with her shit for two hours. <laughs> so... <laughs> I, I, that's what I think this place is, you know, is a chance to, to, so you're not bored. I think the, 
in the ideology that the one is trying to separate and experience the many, it, it's got to be bored. It has to be boring to have no growth or change or anything. And that's all that happens in this creation is change and movement constantly. It's at play. I don't see this place as being created by a creator. I see this place is the creator. That's kind of how I look at it. And I'm not saying that's correct or not. I'm saying that's my approach. Yeah, so interesting. I love it. And uh, going back a little bit to what you were saying about the seven deadly sins and the seven virtues and how you noticed that one is more doing and the other is more being. And so that's interesting. Can you can you uh, name those seven sins and virtues for us? Yeah, I can pull them up here too. I've got a somewhere. Somewhere out there, yeah. I've got yeah. the seven deadly sins. Where are they? Because I I, I certainly know of them, but uh, I have not. So, yeah, hang on. I got to do the present again, right? It's present. Exactly. Here I go again. Uh, and so, entire screen, yes. And then I click that. I'm getting good at this. Fifth time is a charm. So you can see my screen now? Yeah, I'm going to. Kind of. Yeah, I'll, I'll blow this up. Right there. There See you it? go. Okay, yes. Yeah, okay. so on the left are the sins, pride, greed, wrath, lust, envy, uh, gluttony, which is one of the, my big ones I don't get over. I like my drinking and smoking and <laughs> I'm a glutton. <laughs> sloth. So sloth is really the only one that isn't doing. Like I said, that it's it's most of these are more about doing shit to, you know, and, and when you look on the right with the 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 virtues, prudence, justice, temperance, courage. These are states of being, faith, right? Hope. You don't have to really do anything except for charity. But again, like I said, when you do charity, you're actually relieving the, the, the labor of the doing of others so that they can be. Um, Interesting. Now, Matt and I talked about He's saying, well, you know, vibrations can be higher or lower, but the, the one white magnetic light of God has no vibrations. It's still. So when you think about which of these are ex exuding energy, well, all the, all the things that pride, greed, wrath, lust, envy, gluttony make you do, they make you do stuff and expend energy, right? When you look at the right side, actually, these are things that make you abstain from expending energy because they're like temperance, courage. They're about being instead of doing. You see what I'm saying? Interesting. Yeah. Could you keep it up for? Uh, Sorry. Yeah, I can. That's okay. Uh, that's okay. Just to uh, discuss it a little bit more. Yeah. Shit. Sorry. Uh, how do that's do okay. that? Here we go. Yep. Go on. There it is. Good. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So are you familiar with David Hawkins uh, scale of emotion? I actually am more familiar with a, a very similar version by, Lester Levinson. And this is part of how I have been um, teaching and training students and, and work with clients as well. And there's a, so th there are some clues in this, in the deadly sins, for example, sloth is going to coincide in my opinion with apathy, right? You're slothful when you kind of don't care, you don't feel, you might be numb, um, you have no motivation, you might feel helpless in that and it makes you slothful. And it's interesting how it seems like this is not doing, but it, it actually requires the most energy ever to be this. In, interesting, in that, yeah. In that, it, it, it is the, the biggest suck of energy that you can have, which is you know people's depression, how that can go on for a year or two years or 25 years. And it you know their life adds up to literally nothing, but they spent their whole life doing it. <laughs> yeah, and, and all the pain they suffer, and the, yeah, and the, probably the mental and emotional energy they expel from the what do you call it—the consequences of not doing any of that and, and no reward. Is that how you mean? Yeah, it's that's, very that's expensive. Yeah. It's very expensive to uh, to run apathy as a if you want to call it a program. I try not to refer it to it that way, just so people can learn what programs are. But um, you know, and when you look at at uh, say gluttony, this this won't go in, in any kind of an order here, but um, that and I would I would put gluttony and lust in the same category. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at envy, that to me is actually a form of pride. That jealousy when you when you have a sense of separateness 
from other people and you go, oh, well, I wish I had that great beard that you have. I, I don't have a great beard like you. I'm glad <laughs> you know. I'm glad I don't do it, actually. <laughs> so I throw that in there. And, um, Go in the circus. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you're saying, yeah, but you're right. Yeah, they're actually, yeah, they're this, again, they're the, they're opposites, but they're the same. Right. That's, yeah. That's, and again, hermeticism pride is like, I'm proud that I got this Mercedes. And the other guy's like, I want your Mercedes. So I'll walk over anybody I can get to be like you. But, right. But they both walked over somebody. That was the action. You know? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Like most of most of these qualities um, say the the greed, the envy, the gluttony. I know that's more lust. But anyway, there's a lot of sins of pride. There's pride is a very, very big one. And then the pride you're talking about when you're happy about your Mercedes, if it's really, you know, come from a, a clean and loving motive, then to me, that's actually courage. That's not pride at all. And I think it's no mistake that we called that pride and we called pride a sin so that people didn't have the courage to just feel happy about their accomplishments, just uh, that they should feel guilty, which is another form of pride. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, and like the thing about pride is, uh, you know, George Carlin made a joke, you know, he's like, you know, a gay pride, he's, he's, or, you know, I'm proud to be Irish. He's like, you, you had no choice. You were born that way. Be happy to be Irish, not proud. Because pride starts excluding others and separating yourself, you know, from others and get, gives you like a superiority complex. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it's like be, be happy. Don't, don't be proud. Pride cometh before the fall, as they say. And you nailed it about the, the separateness. And some people are very surprised to see that, yes, a sense of superiority over others creates that division of pride, but also a sense of inferiority creates that division of pride. I call it, I'll call it reverse pride or inverted pride, but mm -hmm. it's still pride. And all of these have signature vibrations, which actually help you to, um, to be able to categorize it accurately. Cause to me, these are, these are hardwired installations that we can't muck with. You can't, you can't break it up. It just is what it is. And, and when you discover it, it's, like there it is. There's no, there's no mucking around. But what we do have the choice with is where are we going to vibrate on that? And you know, so a lot of people get make, maybe get like, stuck in the sloth, or they get stuck in the lust, or they get stuck in the wrath, which would be the anger side of it. And then slowly you default higher and higher up the scale into things that you're going to find on on the other side, right? When you got the courage, that's the first step after pride where you start being able to make much, um, you know, when, you, when you're talking about zooming out, your, your decisions are much less about that, like little me, self-preservation and my, my wants, my needs, my, my safety, my survival. And, uh, and then next on the rung would come acceptance, like you talked about, it's very high, it's a very high place. And then from there, uh, all the forms of peace, which to me, you, the faith, the hope, the charity, uh, I'd have to, look up temperance uh and and prudence and justice are interesting yeah, temperance is just your temperament like you instead of wrath you, you're it's acceptance you could call it you know right, you, like you, you, you wrong me I, I don't have to i don't have to go crazy over it i can just you know try to understand it i, I look at it like that right right having a choice and having some self-control which is good <laughs> to have yeah. self -control. Control is really demonized. I mean, you could also apply natural law to this list too, which is, you know, you take the Ten Commandments or natural law, do no harm, which, which you know, when you take the Ten Commandments, it's basically do no theft or harm. Right. And when you look on the left side of the, the sins, you're either harming someone else or yourself to get all that shit, right? And on the right side, you're just all that doesn't, you don't do any harm to anyone. Again, one of them's doing harm and the other one's to not doing anything. Yes, but th this is this is the trap of ascension in in the way that I've looked at it is that from that place, I mean, we we love our um, hope and salvation and courage and um, justice. Again, I, I'm I'm not even sure I would put that in this in this uh, list of words. The charity, that that generosity, that that we get attached to those high emotions. They're also expensive. In fact, the, the, the higher you go up, the more expensive energetically these things are. And then we never do actually find God. And, um, 
or have an experience, a direct experience of that. <clears throat> and we're, mis we're mistaking all of these on the right-hand side as our godly experience and the attachment to them and the aversion to not having them ends up sticking us right where we are. Yeah, it's like the old joke. Uh, there, there's a joke like, uh, oh, I, I, I just became enlightened, so now I'm finally better than you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. If you If you identify with those and become attached to them, is that what you mean? They're just as bad if you identify as that and get attached? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that's why, like, for example, people love lust because it's one higher than fear. Nobody likes fear. So when you get into lust, even though that's an, another kind of pain, then it masks the fear that is, yeah. is there. And, yeah. Uh, and again, yeah. on the right side, you know, the, you can run into the trap of playing the one up, uh, the one up yourself game on yourself. Again, like I said, you know, I, I'm doing yoga now. So I, I'm better, you know, it's like you're kidding yourself again instead of accepting yourself. You're, you're trying to do something, you know what I mean, to identify. You're, you're still, anytime you do something to try to be something else, you're reaffirming that there's a problem in the first place. Does that make sense? Absolutely. You are affirming the lack. You got it. Right. Yeah, you, you get it. that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. That's good. And then, and then you, you just see how it plays out in real life and, you know, God bless everybody, but those Christians, oh my gosh. I've <laughs> never been so I've never been so attacked in my life when I was, when I was trying to be one and, you know, I'm just asking questions like a little kid. I just want to know. And they're like, Oh, that's evil. You know, X her out. She's asking about oneness. Oh, definitely can't uh, talk about oneness. That's some kind of satanic thing. And it's just like, well, what about, what about all these virtues that you supposedly have? Right. And what, what is that? What good has it done you? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, being overly virtuous, should I shut this or do you want me to keep this open or? Uh, I'm good for now. If, if you are, unless you want to show us anything more, you're. No, you're I don't to. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you could, yeah, we could say even being overly virtuous could be another sin actually, <laughs> you know, uh, stop right. Sorry. Right. If yeah. it, whatever, whatever makes you separate from other people and from yourself, because that's actually where separateness is registered, then yeah, exactly. So yeah, well, also the idea of the self, you know, like you're, uh, you're like, oh, now I'm better. And you're like, well, who's watching who be better and who's watching who watching who be better. So, so that's some of the Eastern philosophy is like the joke is you're you're, you're never going to be different. You're you at the core, <laughs> whether you watch and you fake being better, you know, you're really only one up in yourself, not anyone else. <laughs> which is yeah. the joke, kind of. <laughs> exactly. And nature does that. Like I'm just, I watched some of my plants grow and, uh, and it's outdoing itself. It was, it was glorious last year and now it's like this yeah. kind of thing, you know, and, and it's, it's partying over there, having, having the fun and the glory of growing. Yeah. It's kind of, you know, it, it, it's kind of like uh, they say like, the eyes are the most beautiful gems on the planet. Like your, there's no be more pretty gem than your eyes. Your eyes don't have virtue. They're not trying to be beautiful. They just are. Nice. nice. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So nice. exactly. And, and we're all trying to like, we're beautiful. We just don't accept ourselves as that. You know, we we're we're each individual. There's no other you anywhere. Ever was. Ever will be. You're a rare, you're the rarest, most precious gem, you know what I mean? Uh, so, you know, you're, why would you try to change that? It's crazy. Yeah, it really is crazy. Well, this has been a fabulous conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed uh, so far. Is there anything that you we didn't talk about yet that you're hoping to? Um, you know, basically what I wanted to say is, you know, we were talking about what happens after you die or do you come back or reincarnation? And again, as we said in the beginning, I don't know. I, I like all ideas, but the thing is, the main thing to take away, like, what can you do with this? It's going to happen anyway. So get busy living here. You know, if you're afraid of death and you're stunted because you're afraid of dying, it's because you're not really living. I think there was that movie Shawshank Redemption. You know, it says, like, get busy living or get busy dying, you know. Um, so all this obsession over it, I think, is a good sign to look at yourself. And say, I, I'm not happy here. And if I'm not, you should be happy here unless 
your neighbors are Israel dropping, you know, well, I can't say it on YouTube, but you know, like yeah. if your house is exploding. I, I can understand you're not happy, but um, I think for a lot of people, yeah, if you have a fear of death, that's usually the main thing holding anyone back from any action. Right. Wow. Well, you're rare, Steve. You're rare. That yeah. But you know what I mean? Like, uh, I'm, I like I'm on this big diet. I'm not going to eat I, I, like all these food people. Don't eat that. And that's got hydroglycerins, chloride. Blah, 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 blah. And you're like, well, are you going to live to 90 and not eat like a decent pasta, man? Like, come on. Have you ever eaten like, <laughs> a really good creamy pasta? It's got fat and sugar and shit in there that tastes delicious, you know? <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah, that's another archetype on the hero's journey, the hedonist. And I'm I'm here to reclaim that hedonist and and not, uh, you know, yeah, exactly that. Because we are here to inherit the pleasures of the earth. It wouldn't be created as it is if it wasn't, you know, the the, the thing that it is. So that's fantastic. Yeah. And, well, uh, I'd actually, yeah, I'd, I'd actually, Beth, thanks for having me on, by the way. Uh, I'd like to get you on my channel so you can tell me about more of the hero's journey. I'm really fascinated by this and, and the archetypes and stuff. Uh, because I'm with you on that, you know, again, I do think the spirit and the flesh are connected and a lot of the religious dogma or the even the Gnostic and, and uh, Hermetic text. It's all about don't abstain from having any fun here so that you overcome the pleasures of the world. It's like, dude, why are there pleasures in this world? If you believe God created this place, why did it or he or she put all this fucking fun shit around here if you're not going to get into it? <laughs> you know, exactly. you know, exactly. so you can get over it and stuff you're like well to me that sounds just way more like more of this control ideology you know i i, I don't see it like that in, in moderation i don't think you're supposed to just be a total glut in here either right right yeah yeah no i look forward to talking to you. i'm going to send you a copy of my book if you like steve and then uh, uh, then we'll get yeah. into that yeah yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, and then, and then with reincarnation, I did I did ask a white bearded guru on a mountain in India about reincarnation, and he said, "Don't you have enough to handle in this lifetime?" <laughs> exactly. Like, you need to go chasing, and he wasn't all good by any means, that guy. But uh, but that was wisdom right there. And I do have some of my own direct experiences from dreams, from knowledge I shouldn't have. <clears throat> that I didn't study, that I, it just came with me or whatever it is. Like we, you know, I have my own inklings around it, but neither do I focus on it because it's, uh, I got life right in front of me and let's, let's take care of that. Right. Yeah. I'm the same, you know, if, if the Easterners are right and, you know, people who have had real near death experiences are probably like, you don't know what you're talking. I, I, I admit it. I don't, but if it is when you find, maybe you do go get a life review or whatever. And there comes a time when you get out of that thing, they experience into another one and you sh your consciousness shuts off and the next baby that wakes up is the same baby you woke up as it, it's happening either way whether you like it or not you know or if you go to heaven or another plane or whatever so you know again you're you're supposed to be enjoying the now so why are you worried if why are you worried about yesterday tomorrow or even worse 30 years from now or whenever you die you don't even know when you're going to die so I mean, how, how stupid to miss out on the on the prize, worrying about uh, the dessert. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and Evan just said a boom here. And loving God is also a pleasure, the deepest one. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. There you go. That is beautiful. Well, I think that's a fantastic note to uh, end on. I've loved talking to you, Steve. I knew I would. Just and that's <laughs> often, often how I choose based on a, a you know a sense of it. And then I went looking in your work, and I'm like, oh, this is super interesting. And you just have a way of being so open-hearted that I appreciate very much. And you too as well. Yeah, I knew when we met, I thought we got a good chemistry. I like her. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll talk again and I'll get you on my channel and you can take me to school. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> you can take you to school, yeah. Uh, yeah. Whether you like it or not. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> take me to school. <laughs> All right. Good. All right. Have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you, everyone in the chat. And we made them quiet. They must they might be uh, contemplating our um, shadow band. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All yeah, right. Take care, well, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. That's what it's about. That's what swimming is about. So you're not going anywhere. Getting together and uh, chanting together is what a lot of people do when they don't have television to look at.
in uh, the jungles, on the steppes, in mountain communities, since as long as anyone can remember, people got together and do a thing I call digging sound. And played with the sonic energy of the universe in just the same way as I described somebody playing with the water while swimming. And these people, when they do that, they don't worry about where they're going or what their destiny is or any nonsense of that kind because they're completely alive. So to understand all that I'm trying to say, I would like to see if you could change your basic notions of economics. And I mean the economics of energy. We are always scrimping and saving because our economics are based on scarcity rather than exuberance. But notice that the economics of nature are allegedly wasteful. They're based on exuberance. Many more seeds than are necessary for trees. Many more spermatozoa than are necessary for people. Many more stars than anybody could conceivably want. Galaxies galore. Nature is a vast celebration of energy. But if you complain about this and say, oh dear me, it's all running out. That means, you see, that you are looking for fulfillment in time and you say, if there is not enough future, we won't get the golden goody we're looking for at the end of the line. See, there is that feeling, there is the great golden goody. But that flower, the golden goody, isn't at the end of the line. You're in it. The radiating petals, the mandala, the great circle of the flower, is the galaxy in which you live. It is uh, the whole universe radiating around you in which you are. And this radiation is also cycling. It's the dance in which you're involved if you'd only realize that the purpose of life is not in the future. And if you think it is, you'll go on and on and on looking for it there and never find it. Because the future in its own way fades out in the same way as the past fades out. You get older and older and older. And if you don't come crash, you just peter out. It wasn't there. And you may feel vaguely cheated about the whole thing. You were given the come on. That there was something coming. There was that thing at the end of the line, the golden goodie. You've been sitting in the middle of the golden goodie all the time.